Well, I want to welcome each of you here tonight for our first variety program. Um, we uh, have first Friday events uh, frequently. Uh, I mean, we're always open on the first Friday here at the International Quilt Study Center and Museum, but sometimes we have a special program. And so tonight, uh, I am your program and I get to talk with you a bit about Ernest Haight. Um, tonight's program is brought to us by Humanities Nebraska. That is, it is a statewide nonprofit organization cultivating an understanding of our history and culture with additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. And if you enjoy the type of programming that we have here tonight, we ask that you would please consider Humanities Nebraska with a contribution. Donations are matched by state and federal funds and your support helps preserve our past and inform our future. And I want to give a personal thanks to Humanities Nebraska for their support of this exhibition. It's made possible several things uh, that have enriched the experience for all of our visitors, both here at the museum and online. The importance of being earnest, what's the buzz all about? Ernest Byron Haight was born July 20, 1899, near David City, Nebraska. His father, Elmer Haight, and his mother, Flora Burr Haight, were both children of parents who homesteaded prairie claims in Butler County, Nebraska. Apart from Ernest's college years in Lincoln and his final years at the St. Joseph's Retirement Home in David City, he lived on and worked that land his entire life. They called the, the land El Dorado Farm. During the large middle section of his life, Ernest also made quilts, maybe as many as 300 of them. His quilt making began in about 1934 when he criticized the imprecise piecing of a quilt his wife was quilting. And in response, Isabel, his wife, challenged him to prove he could do better, and if he couldn't, just keep his mouth shut. Uh, he began serious quilt making in acceptance of that challenge, but he continued quilt making as a hobby for at least 50 years for reasons that I hope we can explore tonight. This farmer and university trained engineer was at first sheepish about his quilt making, sending Isabel to buy the fabric so the store clerk wouldn't think he was a little bit off. And by 1951, he told a newspaper reporter in Omaha that he didn't consider quilt making exclusively a womanly hobby and that, quote, I believe it doesn't necessarily make a fellow a sissy, end quote. Beginning in the 1970s, Ernest, his quilts, and his method of machine quilting, unorthodox for the time, gained national exposure. His methods of piecing and machine quilting created a buzz among quilt makers around the country. The Nebraska State Quilt Guild recognized Ernest's contributions to quilt making through induction into the Nebraska Quilters Hall of Fame in 1986, little more than a year before his declining health brought his quilt making to an end. Now, I've given a similar introduction uh, to that, to Ernest Tate, uh, a number of times, and it almost sounds like a eulogy at a funeral, unfortunately. Um, and if you don't mind tonight, I'm just going to call him Ernest. Uh, I have gotten to know him so well that we are on a first name basis. So many times uh, I've also recounted the story of Isabel's challenge to prove uh, to him to prove he could do better, just as Ernest told that same story over and over. But I believe the reasons for Ernest's quilt making are not so simply explained. What I mean is that that little story, which got better with time, by the way, explains Ernest's first one or two quilts but it isn't sturdy enough to explain why he quilted for 50 years, made about 300 quilts, created original quilt and border designs, and innovated processes. It doesn't explain why he routinely entered the county and state fairs, why he wrote a booklet, a booklet 
laying out his efficient methods for piecing and machine quilting, and why he issued an open invitation for all interested persons to stop by the farm and he would show them his prize-winning quilts. Now, I recently read 45 years worth of Isabel's daily diaries. In four lines per day, Isabel recorded what she considered noteworthy about their lives from 1943 to 1987. Just to give you a flavor of what these diaries contain, let me share an entire story she told in eight words. And in this story, Isabel refers to Ernest as dad. Cat caught chicken, dad shot cat, fried chicken. <laughs> Isabel noted Ernest's quilt making with regularity in her diaries, which she often abbreviated to Ernest sewed. In fact, he quilted so frequently that she fell to writing, Ernest sews practically every evening. And quilting, of course, just to save room in her daily entries. So why did Ernest make quilts for so long? To gain an understanding of why a person does something is never really very easy, because most anything we do as humans is backed by rather complex motivations that even we don't fully understand. If Ernest had written down why he made things, I would have a lot easier time of it tonight. But he made very few direct statements that were recorded. Nevertheless, the closest observer of his life, Isabel, provided clues in her diary. Also, Ernest's eagerness to share his quilts and methods with others suggest other reasons. His quilts themselves, bold and individual, provide material evidence of his innovative processes and the intellectual activity behind them. And lastly, from a variety of sources, comes a picture of a person who was always conceiving of and making things from childhood until old age. To tell you my conclusion right up front, I believe that quilt making answered an important need for Ernest. I might even say that making of any kind fulfilled the need, though I believe Ernest found quilt making the most fulfilling sort of making. So let's take a little trip through his lifetime and let's see if at the end we gain some sort of an understanding or insight into what making in general and quilt making in particular gave Ernest a buzz. Ernest himself wrote a diary intermittently while a child between the years of 1911 and 1918. He recorded bits about school, farm work, church, and the recreation at home. He and his brothers Lewis and Elton passed countless hours in the shop on El Dorado Farm. At their disposal were tools and a supply of wood and metals from which they made toys and other practical items. As an early teen, Ernest built an engine powered by compressed air. He under-engineered it and it exploded. Um, he avoided harm, but he learned what he would do differently on his next try. It was just that his dad didn't let him try again. His earliest entry about making was a day-by-day -day progress record of making a set of wooden tools for his youngest brother Elton's fifth birthday. Over the years, he also built accessories to dim headlights on their Model T. He crafted new drumsticks for their family's fife and drum corps. And inside the house, Ernest knitted sweaters for the Red Cross's relief efforts during World War I. Also, Ernest recorded drawing and painting and even entered one of his artworks into a competition at the county courthouse. Ernest studied ag engineering or agricultural engineering at the University of Nebraska here in Lincoln, actually just across the street from here. At that time, the, cur the curriculum included a number of hands-on courses such as metal casting, carpentry, engine repair, and mechanical drawing. And in these courses, Ernest advanced his manual skills and he learned advanced processes for working with various materials. In addition, his courses in geometry, trigonometry, calculus, physics, and other mechanical uh, courses developed his intellectual faculties and honed his acumen in solving mathematical and mechanical problems.
After graduation from the university, Ernest didn't go into engineering, but returned to the Hates farm with his enhanced skills, and he applied them routinely in maintaining farm equipment, designing and building repairs, constructing outbuildings, and also to his various hobbies. After his marriage to Isabel in 1928, and the children came along, Ernest began to make wooden toy puzzles for the children on his treadle power bandsaw. Some of these puzzles um, were these, like these 3D toys consisting of many little pieces of wood that fit together and were held together by one small piece, sort of a linchpin. When that piece was removed, the toy fell apart and the child could just start putting it back together again. In this image, it's a tank and it's the little gun on the side that holds it all together. In 1934, Ernest modified the family's treadle sewing machine by designing and building a walking foot. He was making some quilted pads for Isabel to use with their third child whose birth was imminent. And he was also making some utility quilts from old blocks that the family had on hand. On March 11th, 1934, he wrote, again in a diary that was very intermittent, he wrote, designed and nearly completed a traveling foot for the sewing machine as an aid in machine quilting. It should help keep the top and bottom from creeping. His accumulated skills and knowledge had come in handy. Now on the 18th of the month, he wrote, the new foot works excellently. Now in about 1934 is when he and Isabel had that little conversation about the inaccurate quilt. And this is when he made his first serious quilt. I say serious to make a distinction between it and the utility quilts that he had made for their baby and for warm winter covering. His first serious quilt was a double T quilt. He later wrote that he decided to make the T's white rather than dark as most quilt makers would have done in the past so that the T's emerged from this darker background. He also isolated the T element from the block to design an original border. His second serious quilt completely departed from the square grid of pieced block style quilts. For this quilt, Ernest drafted a full size pattern for the medallion format quilt. And then the design for one of his next quilts was developed from the pattern reflected in a multicolored bits of glass in a kaleidoscope. These and subsequent quilts display that Ernest mentally engaged with the two-dimensional geometric designs, selections of colors, and creation of original borders or patterns. Ernest explained the many things he found engaging in quilt making in a letter in 1978. He said, quote, for years I've been intrigued with puzzles and after I got started piecing quilt blocks, every different pattern is a new puzzle. The choice of color, how best to fit the pieces together, how to modify the pieces to avoid unnecessary seams in some of the adjoining pieces of the same color, or ways to use assembly line methods in piecing the blocks. Ernest's assembly line speed assembly line processes sped up the piecing and reduced the variability of results inherent in manual processes. In other words, they gave more consistent, accurate outcomes. He did this by sewing before cutting. Rather than cut myriads of little rectangles or squares as it would be necessary for the quilt you see here, Ernest sewed together strips and then cut across the seams to create pre-sewn units. Here's how Ernest described the process he used for his broken star quilts. Quote, I cut the various color fabrics into 36 inch strips. Then I sewed the strips into six panels, the colors in the right sequence in each panel. I cut a proper width strip from each of the six panels, each of these strips of diamond shaped pieces already sewn together. Sew these six strips together in the proper order and presto, one thirty-second of the quilt blocks are pieced." End quote. He did something similar to create squares made from two triangles of con contrasting fabric. Ernest's speed sewing processes were so efficient that Isabel recorded in January, on January 31st, 1969, that he was working on his ninth quilt since Christmas. 
Quilt making provided Ernest with intellectual and aesthetic challenges. I don't think Ernest had to dig as deeply into his design, drawing, math, and other skills when he was farming as he did when he was quilt making. His design possibilities were limited only by the edges of that rectangular quilt. Quilts, their, their modular construction, first from small pieces of fabric into blocks, and then blocks into the whole, encouraged experimentation to discover the most efficient and accurate processes. Farming did have challenges too, though. These are quilts Ernest Pieced and his hand, father hand quilted during the severe drought of the Great Depression, probably between 1934 and 1939. Ernest's oldest son, Aubrey, told me in an interview that their family's crops failed in 1935 and 1936 and that they were chewed up by grasshoppers in 1937. Now the Haights by the 1920s had been considered somewhat prosperous and with Isabel, uh, excuse me, somewhat prosperous and with sizable investments in the local bank. But they lost their investments to bank failure, they had no crops, and in the middle of the depression, they were forced to borrow money to survive during these lean, dusty years. So as we look at these quilts, we can think possibly that quilt making did more than provide a mental and aesthetic challenge to Ernest. It might also have fulfilled a need to succeed and have something to show for his labors at times when the farm didn't. These quilts are bright counterparts to the dreariness that afflicted much of the Great Plains during the 1930s. As the 1940s dawned, the drought ended, and the wartime economy heated up, Ernest spent less time making quilts, though he didn't stop. He was busy with a family of five children and the constant cycles of sowing and reaping that again gave him something to show for his work. He was also building and maintaining institutions as a leader in their Baptist church. He was treasurer of the school board, an officer in the Breeders Association, and a volunteer fundraiser and blood donor for the Red Cross. So he had plenty to keep himself engaged. In the later 1950s, when all but his youngest daughter had left home, Ernest increased his quilt making. In fact, by 1960, he had so many quilts pieced that his mother, who took over the hand quilting when his father died, just couldn't keep up. Ernest's machine quilting in 1934 had been for utilitarian items, things strictly for daily use, and he seemed to have not kept that up, leaving the quilting to and or tying to others in the family. But he returned to machine quilting to tackle that backlog of quilts, trying several approaches to find the most efficient and attractive design. Now consider that in 1960, Ernest was 61 years old. And so as he has aged, and he has started to gradually reduce his work on the farm, he has increased his quilt output. Now possibly quilt making was a productive outlet and it kept his mind sharp as he entered into his senior adult years. During these empty nest years, Isabel recorded Ernest's quilt making frequently in her diary. She recorded the names of quilts, when he was drawing a new pattern, when he was lost in thought about a quilt idea, and bits about his quilt making processes. In 1962, Isabel wrote, that Ernest said he quilted so he wouldn't crack up. His daughter Mary said, quote, when I was growing up, dad would come in from chores, sit down, and he was just in a little world by himself. He would sit there and work on quilts till really late in the night, and his focus was just so totally on. It was almost like a job to him, but yet at the same time, he really loved it, end quote. I believe Ernest needed to make quilts. It did something to keep him together. I think it made him feel alive, fulfilled, productive, and engaged. That's what the buzz was all about for Ernest. Ernest then took his quilts public, and he created a buzz there too. 
He first entered the public eye in the late 1940s when he began entering quilts in the Butler County Fair in David City. Now, I'm not surprised that Ernest shared something so personally important as his quilt making with others. And I'm not surprised that he created a buzz among others by doing so. In February 1951, the Omaha World Herald ran a feature on Ernest and his quilt making. And Isabel wrote in 1953 that the Hates were proud of their family-made quilts and enjoyed sharing them with others. The sharing, apart from the Omaha article, was very local until 1967 when Ernest entered and won first prize at the Nebraska State Fair for his Nebraska Centennial Quilt. Possibly because of his novelty as a male quilt maker or his innovations, he garnered a lot of attention. A Lincoln TV station contacted him for a story and he was asked to give demonstrations at the fair. The fair created a category for machine quilted entries, largely because of him, and he kept winning prizes. Quilt makers in the state got interested in him, and so did Bonnie Lehman, the editor of Quilter's Newsletter magazine. The first quilt periodical addressed to the widespread rediscovery of quilt making in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Lehman recognized that her readers were hungry for traditional and contemporary approaches to quilt making. Ernest's machine quilting and assembly line techniques were right for her readers, and she published them in early 1971. Lehman also included the same information in her book, Quick and Easy Quilting, in 1972. Other authors followed in other years, including Ernest's machine quilting methods in their books. One of these authors, Robbie Fanning, called Ernest the father of machine quilting, a title he honestly thought he wasn't worthy of. Ernest and Isabel issued an open invitation to show their prize-winning quilts to any quilt maker that stopped by. Isabel recorded nearly 200 times they answered inquiries and shared their quilts at their home, in the community, at quilt guilds or civic club programs, or in exhibitions around Nebraska. This between the years of 1957 and 1987. Ernest and Isabel's quilts were displayed for 90 days in the early 1971 at the Stir Museum of the Prairie Pioneer in Grand Island. Later, one of his quilts was included in an exhibition of Nebraska quilts at the Sheldon Museum of Art here in Lincoln. And his quilts were shown in a solo show at the Elder Gallery at Nebraska Wesleyan University in 1981 an exhibition that broke all prior records for visitation of any exhibition there. In 1977, Ernest and his quilts made an appearance at the Quilt Symposium sponsored by the Lincoln Quilters Guild, also held at Nebraska Wesleyan. There, Ernest's quilts were introduced to an audience interested in the study of quilts, as well as quilt making. Now, some of those visitors who stopped by were from outside the state of Nebraska having heard of Ernest through his 1974 self-published book, Machine Quilting for the Homemaker. He fulfilled orders by mail to addresses across the nation and internationally. And some of these readers wrote Ernest for help or encouragement with their quilting. And Ernest happily shared in his personalized replies an answer to every letter. He offered the assistance they requested, but he also repeated a few paragraphs in almost verbatim in each letter. He included things about the Haight's family heritage as homesteaders, descriptions of the wooden puzzles he made, the story of Isabel's challenge that started his quilt making, and how quilt making was like puzzle solving for him. And occasionally, he would share how he thought anyone could do what he would, had done because, quote, it was easier than you think, end quote. And because of their repetition, one might say that these elements, these were elements of Ernest's public identity that he was crafting and sharing with others. Simultaneously, some of these visitors that became customers, hiring Ernest to do machine quilting on quilts that they had pieced. Some hired Isabel to do hand quilting. She was a prize winning hand quilter. And on occasion, Ernest sold quilts to some of these travelers or inquirers. Ernest liked to say that he didn't sell his quilts because if he did, he wouldn't have anything to show people. 
More accurately, he didn't sell his best prize-winning quilts, but he did sell quilts that he thought appropriate for everyday utility. Isabel recorded at least 10 of these sales. Ernest and Isabel also gave away quilts. Isabel recorded 85 quilts they gave as baby, graduation, wedding gifts for their friends, their neighbors, church members, and family members between 1960 and 1985. In addition, they gave at least 100 quilts to their kids as annual Christmas gifts between the years of 1966 and 1986. Most of Ernest's public sharing of quilts and processes began when he was in his late 60s. So just to call attention, he was 68 when he made his first entry into the Nebraska State Fair, 75 when he published his booklet, 78 when he attended the Quilt Symposium, and around 80 when he was invited to Washington, D.C. to teach at the Continental Quilting Congress, an invitation he declined because he and es Isabel were not able to make a journey of that sort at their age. And at 87, he was inducted into the Nebraska Quilters Hall of Fame. I think Ernest's influence might have been more significant if he had been a little younger and Isabel's health a little better when these opportunities started to come his way. But Ernest wasn't sharing in order to make a name for himself or gain for, from participating in the quilt business. In 1980, Ernest wrote to Helen Erickson, the publisher of Mrs. Danner's quilt pattern books, and he said, quote, I had never planned to capitalize on this, but primarily just to share this information with others, end quote. So what was the buzz all about? Ernest innovated in machine quilting and speed piecing methods, and he shared this through avenues that influenced the generation of women, and of course a few men, who discovered or renewed their interest in quilt making in the 1960s and 70s. Ernest's original designs and unique sense of color made his quilts eye-catching and appealing to many. And all throughout his life, he was a maker and quilts in particular kept his mind alert and provided opportunity to create and produce throughout all seasons of his life. It satisfied something that in him that was necessary, something that was uniquely his and a reflection of who he was. In the early 1980s, Ernest began to show some small signs of cognitive decline. This worsened and he likely had several small strokes in 1985 and 86. His driving became erratic, his children have told me, and the quality of his quilt piecing and design lost its crispness. Yet, he sewed on. Even after he collapsed in the front yard in 1986, a collapse that signaled a more severe decline, he continued to cut out squares for quilts, just squares. Isabel recorded his last effort at quilt making in October 1987, shortly before he became unable to sew it all. Ernest's quilting presence in Isabel's diary had been so pervasive that when it came to an end, as I read, its absence really saddened me. Her writing shifted to recording his decline in body and mind. The saddest picture in all of Isabel's diaries was when Ernest sat in front of the television after dementia set in, unable to read the captions to her, for she was blind by this time and needed his help unable to engage. A man who had made and made and made for so many years sitting idle, unable to connect with mental processes and physical activities of making that had long been his twin companions, unable to share his pleasure in quilts any longer. In 1988, his condition required him to move to a nursing home in David City, where he lived until his death in 1992. By the time Ernest stopped making quilts, he had made almost 300 quilts and maybe, or possibly more. In that 1980 letter to Helen Erickson, Ernest addressed why he didn't sell those prize-winning quilts. His answer was anchored in his passion for sharing. He wrote, quote, how could we show quilts that we no longer have? We expect any quilts left after we pass away will be divided among our five sons and daughters and our grandchildren, 
I'm sure that will be a legacy that will be prized for many years, end quote. After their parents' death, the Haight family members inherited their legacy of quilts, and because they value the quilts and their parents' accomplishments, I've been able to conduct this research and to begin to discover why Ernest made quilts and to share with you what the buzz was all about. Thank you. Thanks for your attention, and in a moment we'll open the floor for some questions. Uh, we are live streaming this program tonight, and those of you who are watching by live stream, if you have a question, uh, you can send that by email to jonathangrego at gmail, that's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-G-R-E-G-O -E at gmail.com. And in the subject line, please put Ernest. Uh, before we open the floor for questions, let me encourage you again uh, uh, about our sponsorship by Humanities Nebraska. There are audience reaction forums in each of the chairs here. We would certainly like you to fill that out so we can let Humanities Nebraska know how programs of this sort meet your needs and interests. Uh, you can leave the reaction forums in a basket here in front or leave it on your chair as you leave. Um, if you're viewing online tonight, uh, please click the link to the, to the audience reaction form, which is immediately above the viewing window on your screen. We're very thankful for Humanities Nebraska's support of tonight's program and the exhibition, The Engineer Who Could, Ernest Haight's Half Century of Quilt Making, currently on view in the galleries uh, on my right. Um, it's also available online at quiltstudy.org. If you go to the online exhibition, please click down at the bottom to other resources and look at the videos. Uh, there's some great documentary videos that also were funded by Humanities Nebraska. All right, and now I'd like to take your questions. Yes, sir. The question is, um, and I'll repeat this for everyone here and for the online audience, uh, I mentioned letters that he wrote around the country and, and the gentleman asked if I had a chance to see those. I did because uh, something about Ernest was very orderly and he kept carbon copies of his correspondence. <laughs> and then uh, uh, his family saw fit to save those, so I had access to several of those. Yes, in the back. How did the quilts on display fit into his life? Were they early, late, okay. prize winners? Great. The question regarding um, how the quilts that we have in the exhibition, the engineer who could, where do they fit within his life story? Um, we actually chose quilts that spanned the full 50 years of his making. Uh, we have a quilt from the late 1930s. We actually didn't realize it was from that early. Uh, the label in the gallery says it could be from 30s to 50s. Uh, all the way through a quilt he gave to the Nebraska State Quilt Guild uh, in recognition of his honor of being inducted into the Hall of Fame. So from 1930s to 1980s. We chose quilts also that showed a variety of his designs um, and his speed processes, as well as trying to show the work of his father and his mother uh, in their hand quilting. Yes, ma'am? Anything about Ernie you would rather, uh, you'd like to know, but you could not find. Okay, the question from Roger is, is there anything about Ernest that I'd like to know that I couldn't find? Um, well, I know the answer is yes, um, <laughs> but uh, exactly what that might be I just wished I could sit with him and talk for a time um, and ask him some questions. I'd like to ask him, are, are my conclusions correct? <laughs> Is this really why you made quilts? Um, yes, Roger. What happened to his overalls? Uh, the question is, what happened to his overalls? Uh, 
I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, though I do know this that I think is interesting. He bought little pairs of overalls for his grandchildren so when they came to visit, they could go do the chores with him. Yes, ma'am? No, it's a great question. They, uh, in the 1930s, I was talking about their financial reversal, but also making quilts at the same time. And the question is, do I have information of how they had the money to buy fabric for these quilts? It was very clear that these were not quilts made from scraps. They were uh, from fabric purchased specifically because it, it matched. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, in the absence of that, I speculate that says more about how important this activity was to him if he was spending money at that time. Uh, in, in quilt study of that time period, it is one of the most prolific eras of quilt making in the United States. And so is, uh, it's ironic, uh, paradoxical, that there were so many quilts being made when so many people had so little resources? Very good question. Yes, ma'am? The quilt that's on the screen right now, um, it's, it's such an interesting combination of the, the inner pattern and the border. Um, with this dynamic use of border, is that fairly unusual? Something that, that he really took to you that, that others didn't? Or is that fairly common? Uh, the question is regarding uh, the quilt bachelor's puzzle, which is on the screen here, um, and the, the amount of border that is on this quilt in compared, comparison to the center of the, of the quilt. Uh, and if that was something that he explored, and were there others at the time who were doing similar things with borders? Um, it is certainly something he explored. He frequently had a, some sort of customized border element, sometimes reflecting what was in the center of the quilt in its blocks, um, other times uh, truly a bordering element, but just uh, uh, unique to him. Um, I don't know that I could speak to how broadly that was done by others. Uh, I do know that there were always people in every era who were experimenting and expressing their own creativity and their visual ideas through their quilts. So, yes? Do you think that he specifically um, uh, made quilts for hanging, or did he ever, or did he think of them as bedrooms? The question is, did Ernest specifically make quilts for, like for display or show, or did he just make them for beds? No, it was very clear evidence that um, Isabel gave me from her diaries, she describes that Ernest makes quilts for, for the fair. So he, he had certain quilts he made uh, ex for the express purpose to go into the state and the county fair. And the timing of the making of the quilts were typically right before, in the last two months before the fairs were to open. So it's clear that he made a distinction in his own mind between quilts for display and that he thought would win prizes and those that he would give away that he considered utility quilts. Yes, ma'am. Did he start out sharing the machine, sewing machine with Isabella or did he acquire his own machine? The question is, uh, did they share this sewing machine in the family or did he have his own? Um, they always shared a sewing machine. So when he, uh, um, Isabel was sewing clothes, their daughters were sewing clothes, uh, some of the other family members were making quilts, uh, typically they were hand piecing, but uh, so their sewing machine was busy. The treadle sewing machine he used was uh, brought to Nebraska in, in about 1880 by his mother's parents uh, when they homesteaded. Uh, he used that machine until uh, he purchased an electric machine, and I can't remember the exact year, but it was around 1960. 
he did wear out his first electric machine and bought another one uh, a number of years later. All right. Friends, thank you so much for your attention tonight and for these great questions. Uh, it's a privilege to talk to you. I hope you'll take an opportunity to look in the galleries if you haven't been in there yet tonight. And uh, thank you again. Good night. <laughs>